Hello and welcome to another episode of Talking Sunday Readings. I'm Father Chuck Carter, joined as always by my mom Ann Carter and by Pastor Richard Stadler. And this uh, week we are discussing the readings for the 12th Sunday after Pentecost. And our text we'll be covering today are 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 1 through 8, uh, Ephesians chapter 4 <coughs> verses 17 through chapter 5 verse 2, and the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 35 through 51. And so we'll get started uh, with our reading from First Kings. A reading from First Kings. Elijah went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake, baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. Um, we have Jezebel and Elijah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one of the first questions I have when I look at the story of Jezebel and Elijah is, who was the boss in her marriage? Well, she was. It was pretty obvious. <laughs> it was wasn't pretty it? obvious. And if you know the backstory for this, mm-hmm. when poor little King Ahab wants to get a vineyard from Naboth, his vineyard and Naboth won't sell it for any price because it's the family mm-hmm. legacy. Uh, he tells his wife, almost you can hear it with a whining voice, mm-hmm. and she fixes it. Mm-hmm. She goes and has false witnesses uh, accuse. Naboth of blasphemy, and they stone him to death. Mm-hmm. And so she says, "Here, here's," <laughs> and you just think this Ahab for being king of Israel must have been a real whip, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and Jezebel right. is here too, the protagonist who's going to solve the problem for because he's mm-hmm. complaining to her. Well, this Elijah killed all the prophets of Baal. Now what do we do? Yeah. Well, she. What I think is it. fascinating too, she must have been quite a formidable woman, yeah. because Elijah has just been part of this incredible act of God that he has sent down fire from heaven, consumed the offering on Mount Carmel, and he's killed these prophets. And Jezebel puts a hit on him and he runs away scared. Yeah, he is scared to death. He is scared. And that's what's fascinating is that you can be so close to the power of God. Yeah. And yet, I couldn't figure, the only thing I could think of is that he must have been exhausted. And just couldn't, he just couldn't rationally think anymore and just had to get out of town. Well, and I I find him a comfort too, because Mm -hmm. uh, there are times when I may show exemplary courage and other days I just am defeated. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, here's one of God's prophets who had that downtime too. Mm -hmm. And uh, he goes out in the wilderness and he is under a broom tree and the angel comes and wakes him up and says, eat, he had a long journey coming up. And then he Mm -hmm. wakes him up a second time and he feeds him. and. Mm -hmm. And then he finally goes 40 days in the wilderness to the same mountain where Moses and the children of Israel ended Mm -hmm. up. It's kind of interesting how central that location is Mm -hmm. to these events of Israel. Mm -hmm. It shows, too, that um, even in times of courage and strength with the prophets of Baal and also in times of fear and uh, um, escape, God is still there providing for for Elijah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a I, lesson for us too. I wish the story had gone on to the encounter that God has with Elijah. Maybe it would have taken too much time in a worship mm-hmm. service for the lectionary people to have organized that. But boy, this, to me, that's the climax for this story is that yeah. yes, he's scared. Yes, he's depleted and he's tired. And he finally is equipped to go to Mount Horeb or to the mountain of God. And, but that's where God really speaks to him and revitalizes him mm-hmm. and energizes him and says, I've still got work for you to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You haven't been a total failure. Because that's what he says in this lesson is, kill me, God, or, or let me die. I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm worthless. Uh, you can almost supply the words in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a failure. I'm no better than my father's. And you say, oh, come on, Elijah. 
you just were brave and took on all the prophets of Baal. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're not a failure, you know, but it's yeah. easy to think that way. What we think of ourselves is not what God sees a, for us to do. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and God has the potential to rework somebody. Mm-hmm. And so this is a wonderful introduction. And many people, after they hear this in church, will go back and read the rest of First Kings 19 mm-hmm. and 20 and just see how God follows through on this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, how does that relate to the epistle lesson then for this Sunday? I don't know. A reading from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. Putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are all members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving of one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I don't know. <laughs> the one, yeah. well, I guess the one verse that comes to mind as we talk about Elijah's experience is this verse 23, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, uh, clothe yourself with the new self, created according to the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. I think yeah. you see some of that coming through with Elijah. Um, this, this struggle that he has with the powers that be in Israel at the time, and his growth um, in his relationship and deepening understanding of God. Yeah, it's an elemental part of being an imitator of God, as Paul urges the Christians to do in chapter 5, verse 1. Mm-hmm. But uh, the ingredient that you pointed to, the giving of, of a new mind and consciously um, putting aside the impulses of your sinful nature and open yourself instead to the new nature, Mm -hmm. that takes a certain amount of discipline. Mm -hmm. And I like the connection in English anyway between the word discipline and disciple. A disciple is one who is under discipline, uh, Mm -hmm. who is following God and learning from Jesus and opens himself to that kind of influence. Yeah, Because that's Mm -hmm. a conscious decision we can make. Mm -hmm. It's a hard thing to recognize that God doesn't follow the rules of the world. He did with with Elijah and and the and the sacrifice with Baal. They set up the task, and then God met that challenge. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, he doesn't do what you might expect him to do. Mm-hmm. In the encounter with Elijah, he didn't come as the force, as the wind. He came as the small voice, right. and he, and he comes. He asks us to think about him and about living in a different way, new attitude, new. Right. Open yourself up to me. And this is very practical. I mean, just boom, 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 mm-hmm. one thing after another. Speak mm-hmm. the truth. Go ahead and be angry about evil. You should be angry when people abuse kids and when people do things that are wicked. But don't so dwell on it that it, it consumes you. Because that's the problem with us, with our anger, is that it's not often holy anger. It starts out maybe with outrage, but uh, it can poison us. Mm-hmm. And so he says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. And don't give the devil an opportunity because the devil loves to use our righteous outrage in order to ruin us. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. But then he goes on, don't steal, work with the needy, don't let any corrupt conversation come out of your mouth. And I love the idea that if you're going to not steal anymore and work, help the needy Mm -hmm. is tucked in there. Mm -hmm. So it's not just to take care of yourself. He's constantly pushing us and expanding our horizons. Mm-hmm. And this last, in verse 32, chapter 4, verse 32, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Yeah. There's that, that imitation part. That's what all this is about, is, yeah. is um, clothing ourselves in the new self, becoming imitators of God, 
that we can be to each other that that presence that God's kind of imitated imitating God's presence with each other right um, this new life you know incarnating this new life if we're going to copy the way God forgives us what does that really mean in the way I forgive someone else do I first wait until they apologize mm. is that how God forgives us do I make them call through cut glass before I will offer them mercy and forgiveness? I don't see God doing that. I see him offering us forgiveness even before we realize we need it. Mm -hmm. And that's why he let his son die on the cross. So this is a pretty challenging thing that mm -hmm. he's urging upon us. Mm -hmm. And it's very unnatural. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly not normal mm -hmm. for me to forgive someone. And, I, and I've heard people outraged at the kids at Columbine the day after the shooting took place in their school, they offered forgiveness. And I heard radio commentators getting outraged at that. They had no right to forgive those shooters because the only person who can forgive them are the people who were killed and they're dead. Mm. And yet the whole message of Christ's forgiveness is that wrong. God can forgive sins of people who do unthinkable evil. Yeah. And if we're going to forgive each other that way. That means I've got to cultivate a forgiving heart even before the person who has hurt me has realized that they've hurt me and, mm -hmm. yeah. and not let that seethe in me, you know. Mm -hmm. So that when they do finally maybe come to grips and say, I'm sorry, that was really a boneheaded thing I did to you, I'm ready mm -hmm. to offer them forgiveness. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Now, when that mm -hmm. carries us to the gospel lesson, is there a connection there to the story of Jesus? The Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that everyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now we have, perhaps in the sense that as the teaching about forgiveness can be difficult to accept, so uh, is Jesus' teaching about himself as the bread of life was found difficult to accept by many of his disciples so a lot of the people didn't catch on to what he was saying yeah, because they were probably taking him very literally uh, we can't eat your body we can't <laughs> drink your blood mm -hmm. and it, in the when he institutes the lord's supper he will challenge us to believe that he can do the impossible mm -hmm. but i'm not so sure he's teaching the sacrament here i think what he's using the term eat the bread of life drink my blood these are ways for him to use as a metaphor to say he who believes on me has everlasting life now you've got to consume me take me into yourself if you're going to receive eternal life and even though there may be a hint of what he's going to talk about on the Monday Thursday when he institutes the Lord's Supper I think what he was here challenging people with is a metaphor for how do you receive eternal life it's through believing in him how do you get eternal life? It's by consuming Jesus, taking him into your life. And so um, they couldn't get, grasp that. Mm -hmm. And many uh, will not walk with him anymore because of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and that's probably true today. Mm -hmm. yeah. What I found interesting is that I hadn't really noticed before is that three times he says, I will raise you up on the last day. I will raise them up on the last day. Verse 39, verse 40, verse 44, I will raise that person up on the last day. And I know when something's repeated three times, it's important. And I guess I just never thought that it would be a conscious thing that Jesus is going to do is to raise us up and raise up those who believe in him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you are what you eat, right? So that sort of idea. Mm -hmm. um, and in John's gospel, we don't get um, the same sort of institution narrative that we get in the synoptic mm -hmm. gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, whether or not this is, this is teaching around the sacrament, um, there's definitely some, some echoes here of it. And mm -hmm. I, think, I think what, um, you know, this raise, raising up on the last day, I will raise them up, sort of taking Jesus, um, uh, eating his, his body, drinking his blood, um, very controversial kind of thing to say, especially if, if you're in a Jewish context. Mm -hmm. um, I, there is this sense, though, in which um, as we become imitators of Christ, um, we are you know, baptized into a death like his, that we might be ri raised into a life like his. Um, as we um, take Christ into our, our lives, into our bodies, into our hearts, um, so we are going to be raised, we're going to share the same kind of resurrected body that, that Christ now has. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, are, we become part of his body, and yeah. as his body is raised, mm -hmm. so we will be too. Well, mm -hmm. in four chapters after this chapter, uh, you've got Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd, I lay down my life for the sheep. No one takes my life from me. I have authority to lay it down and to take it up again. Mm -hmm. And so he intentionally, throughout his own life, laid down his life. He took his life back up again. That's the mystery mm -hmm. of the Trinity. Father raised him. So he raised himself. Mm -hmm. But that proves that he has the authority to do mm -hmm. that very thing. Mm -hmm. That he can raise us up because he's already raised himself up and he's got the authority to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a wonderful connection with all that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we don't get very far without Jesus. No. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> so some, some interesting readings here. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm.